Hey, what's up? All right, <laughs> what's up, my favorite memer? Okay. I know you are, dude. The more, I the more can't, you talk to me, the more you're going to like me. I, I can't promise. possibly believe that you're going to come out defending this position, but we'll see, okay? So okay, let, me, well, let me state my argument very clearly. My or, 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 or my thesis or whatever, okay? For the 2007-2008 financial collapse, okay, was one of the worst things that has happened in the history of world economies. Massive, far-reaching economies all across the world were impacted by this. When it was going on, I remember people were talking about how we were going to be impacted for over a decade, that it was worse than the Great Depression, that everything was going to be fucked in the United States for so long. And it seemed like pretty much like fucking four or five years later, we had pretty much, I, now I don't want to use the term completely recovered because I know that some indicators, uh, like some things like median wages and whatnot are still like not where they should be. But for the most part, we've kind of, I don't think people are feeling the fucking pain of the housing crisis. That, that was my original contention. And now go ahead. Well, I'll say pretty far right off the bat, you're kind of moving those goalposts pretty far back. Okay, by saying, what, what like, was my original goal for ten years? Like, but that, the, but the, let, I saw, where, how old are you now? Hold on, just curious. I'm not trying to strong. Yeah, I'm 25. Okay, 20. 25. Okay, yeah. Okay, so we're on the same. But I'm 27. At, when the time at the time of the housing market collapse, do you disagree that people were giving these uh, these uh, catastrophic forecasts into how the economics of the world would play out? Do you disagree with that? Maybe maybe that's where our disagreement comes from because I remember it around the time. Also because I was working at the casino when they cut our 401ks and all of our pensions and a ton of our benefits and removed almost all of our PTO and shit as a result of these pressures that were happening. I remember that people were giving the biggest doom and gloom forecast in ever. Like that this was literally going to be worse than the Great Depression, that everything was going to be fucked for so long, right? That's what I remember. Do you, do, do, was it not the same for you or do you, do you disagree with uh, that? Worse than the Great Depression is pure hyperbole. Um, obviously, it was a bad recession for sure, um, and I don't I don't disagree with that. But um, you know, getting back to your point, where you said it was a quick, it was a relatively quick bounce back, and I think it doesn't matter what metrics you really look at. I mean, do, do you know how a recession is typically actually defined in economics? Is after it, it happens. Varies. It very yeah, it varies a little bit. But do you know what like what a recession actually is economically? Oh, the actual definition? Nope. Yeah. So a recession is basically um, two to three quarters, depending on how it's defined, mm -hmm. of consecutive negative GDP growth. So negative economic growth. Gotcha. And the reason recessions are so bad is because we want the economy to grow. If the economy is not growing, then it's basically a waste of time. We, we, we've wasted progress, basically. Um, and so that, that's basically why recessions are so, are so bad. And the, the, the metric by which we gauge when we're out of a recession is when economic growth actually picks back up again. And that simply hasn't happened through the recovery. And that's even getting the med median wages. Yeah, you're right. The median wages have been pretty bad. The unemployment rate was pretty bad. But not even that. But President Obama is the first president since Herbert Hoover to not see 3% annual growth in his presidency across eight years. That's quite an accomplishment. Now, the extent to which Obama gets blamed for that, you can debate that all you want. But the fact that we have, we have, we've had such a huge stretch of period where we haven't had 3% annual economic growth, you can't call that a quick bounce back. It's been anything but that. Okay, so you're the economy meme. Isn't a really commonly put forth thing right now in economics or an idea that's being discussed a lot, the idea that growth that the United States had seen in, in, in its rise is unlikely to ever happen again, the idea that we have to accept that the country has to some extent topped out and that you're not going to be seeing the, these, like, you know, these massive GDP growths year after year after year after year after year? Isn't um, that kind of a thing that, that, that a lot of people theorize that we were approaching kind of like this um, this slope off where we're, we're only going to grow so much because there's only so much more you can grow once you're a developed nation? Yeah, that, I, and I can definitely add a lot to that and clarify what that theory is. And sure. I do agree with the theory. So basically the theory is when you have an economy that's not fully developed, like take China, for example. Or, or India. India. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we're India. They can achieve economic growth through capital accumulation. They build factories. They get um, heavy machinery and they get automation and it just explodes their GDP. Um, and that, that's why you see such miraculous growth. Um, and what tends to happen is you, you, you've heard of the idea of diminishing, diminishing marginal utility, right? The, um, the, more, the more you add to something, the less utility you get out of right. it? The, the, the le not the less utility you get, but the less marginal utility you get. So you still get more utility, but you get a lower margin than you got before. But anyway, there's a similar Wait, hold concept. on, wait, wait. I, just so that I fully understand sure, this sure. concept. So you're talking about like, let's say you give $10 to somebody, they turn around and they take that $10 and they make $20 with it. You give them another $10 and they take that around and they only make $5 with it. When you give them 10 more on top, is that diminishing marginal utility? Kind of. The idea would be that the second $10 gives them less utility, um, not in total, but 11, get, that's why they call it marginal utility. 
So just say, to throw a random number at it, say $10 gives me 100 utils. Well, maybe another $10 only gives me 95 utils. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. That's yeah, basically, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. But anyway, the whole, the whole idea with that um, argument is that um, there, there's also a similar diminishing marginal productivity with capital. You can't, you can't achieve unlimited economic growth simply by accumulating capital. Um, eventually, the return on capital actually um, enters a parity with the interest rate. And at that point, it doesn't make sense to invest in capital because the return on capital is equivalent to the interest rate. And that's called the steady state. And that's where developed economies like the U.S. is. So that's true. That is kind of like um, the, the miracle, miracle growth is totally off the table. It's not going to happen. We're not going to get 11 percent um, growth just through capital accumulation. But the other part and the part of economic growth that is super important for developed economies, and it's the reason why China still has a much larger way to come before it matches the U.S., is that the other source of economic growth, apart from capital accumulation, is actually increases in worker productivity. And those increases in worker productivity are driven by technology innovations, primarily, as well as things like education. So yeah, there is an idea of like, maybe we'll never get um, massive economic growth. And I, I agree with that to a certain extent. However, I will say that 3% economic growth is, growth is the historical average. So I wouldn't say that's miracle growth. Miracle but doesn't growth that historical like, average take into account when we were still developing and booming as a nation? Like, I guess like um, if we can discuss like, um, fuck, I don't. I'm hoping that this is good information here. But right, so like, bring up this graph and look and set it to the maximum time horizon. All right, max time horizon. Yeah. Yeah. So like, even if you look back during the, um, whew, uh, dot com bubble was like or like around 2000 2001 when it finally popped right mm -hmm. right like even when you look at the growth leading up to that like that was that was a period that was like an inflationary period in terms of economic growth right like that wasn't sustainable even that wasn't like massively booming like 10 percent growth you know year after year after year even though that that was you know involved the formation of a bubble that deflated and you see the effects of that right in 2001 and onward Right. It seems like if even in even if in periods of unsustainable growth, we're, we're you know, barely sustaining, you know, this five percent average. Is it really realistic to think that, like, you know, two or three percent is something that we can ca carry well, on yeah. forever? Like, where, where does say, the three percent number come from? I'm curious. So the three percent number comes from a historical average. And I, I say that I know you're saying that that average tends to be folded into yeah, um, into periods of but, insane growth. But when you're when you're gauging the speed at which we exit from a recession. If you look at even during the Great Depression, we had like a three, four year stretch um, during the great, after the Great Depression where we didn't hit 3% growth. And during the early 80s when we had stagflation, it was again three to four uh, years during which we never hit 3% um, economic growth. So here we are with, with a 10 year stretch without hitting 3% economic growth. And 3% isn't one of those miracle 10%, even say 5% economic growth, 3% should still be pretty feasible. And granted, there is a theory out there that sub 3% growth is a new normal and it's here to stay. I think it's too early to say that, but I also think that's kind of, like I said in the beginning, it's moving the goalposts back. We're going to pretend like 3% growth is now the new normal. And you're going to, and that's kind of being, that whole narrative is kind of being used to tout Obama's economic legacy, which my whole narrative is that his economic legacy isn't good. Well, I guess so. So, like when I when I look at that, um, I, I guess the problem is like if you're looking at getting more than three percent, and that's not realistic. Um, well, for, firstly, if that's not realistic, then I think you're always going to look shitty, right? If, if that's not like if that's not sustainable by any economy that exists. And in the I'm, world I'm not even saying like, more than three percent. I'm saying three percent. Sure. I mean, we, we've seen one and two percent economic growth for <laughs> the past ten years. Sure. We, we haven't even hit three percent. That's bad. It's, no matter what period of history you look at, that's very bad, and it's very unusual. During recessions, we almost always bounce back within five years, even during the Great Depression. Sure. So the fact that it's been so long and we haven't bounced back, I think, really goes against the idea that we've bounced back. Well, or it plays into the idea that, you know, 3% is the new normal for, like, maximum full Yeah, speed. exactly. But like I said, I think that's premature, way premature, and it's to actually bounce back for Obama. Yeah, like, sure, that's possible. Do, do, do you think, though, that, like, um, and, and I don't know the technical dimension, I haven't wiki it, but, like, do you, do you think that you can really accurately define the way a recession feels to a people by only looking at GDP? I'll say that's pretty much been the most kind of fair, um, the most fair measure. That's the kind of measurement we've always used. But I'll say when it comes to employment, things like employment tends to be a lot trickier um, because of a lot of things like labor force participation rate. And underemployment so are, and whatnot. Sure. Exactly, underemployment. Um, but I'll say even like, for example, an unemployment, do you remember that the cornerstone of Obama's recovery policy was the economic stimulus? You, you remember that? Yeah. The, are you talking about TARP? No, no. TARP, you... is, TARP, is, TARP is different. TARP was like the, um, 
this is the, I'm talking about the Community Reinvestment Act or whatever it was called. Um, I don't remember the exact name, but it's basically the the stimulus package, the infrastructure spending. Um, it was touted as like the major um, way that um, the Obama administration was going to keep unemployment under a certain rate. And his economist, from his own um, Council of Economic Advisors, said that um, with the stimulus, we project that unemployment will remain under eight percent. And what they said, if we don't do anything, if if we don't do this stimulus and we simply do nothing, then we project unemployment to be about 8.5%. And in actuality, unemployment topped out at nearly 10%. So the projections were way off. And that, that's also why I said, even by their own measurements, their, the recovery was way slower and the, their, own, um, their own sort of solutions fell way short of their own projections. So even using that measurement as opposed to GDP, where, the, and, and of course, with all of these things, there's nuance. There's nuance in the GDP measurement because of the idea of you know, what's, what's the new normal now? And there's nuance in unemployment. But the fact that it's, it fell short of their own projections means it's pretty hard to say that it was, it was a quick bounce back. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't think it's good. Like, I don't, wouldn't say it's a good legacy. Um, I, I guess it's just, I, I, so I guess the disagreement that we have, so I understand your point of view. Your point of view is that when you go by the technical definition of what is a recession, and then you go by the um, quote unquote predicted success of Obama's economic policy versus the actual success of the economic policies, you're saying that because they fell short there and because our GDP growth has been pretty slow, that to call it a quick bounce back is is factually incorrect, right? Yeah, and not, 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 yeah not only that's, I would say even further than that, but I would say certainly it's not a quick bounce back. I don't, I don't, I don't think, I think very few people would argue it's been a quick bounce back. Gotcha. But, I guess, I guess it's just that the way that, the way that I felt, um, and I'm, I'm using a feels argument here, I guess I would have to go back and, and maybe find different indicators, but the way that I felt, it felt like in 2008 that it was being sold to us that literally like we're going to be into new norms of depression, recession area where unemployment is going to be, you know, U you three is going to be like 10% plus and that, uh, you know, people are going to be losing their houses like crazy and cre the, the, you know, the credit crunch and nobody's going to be able to get money anymore or whatever. It seemed like all of these things were being sold as these are going to carry on into like a decade and, and the world world is going to enter like this horrible recession. But it seemed like more or less like five years later, even though we still have problems, I guess, with GDP growth and, and you know, labor participation and maybe underemployment for the most part, like if you look at things like, um, I think like purchasing power of the dollar and, you, you know, unemployment as a whole, um, you know, maybe people aren't getting paid as much as they want or median wages haven't rose as much, you, you know, compared to 2007 for what that's worth. It seems like we, for the most part, recovered and are doing okay, even if the economy isn't like, I guess, booming in the way that we would want it to be. And, well, the way I'll challenge that is I think mm -hmm. the Obama administration was selling a lot more optimism than that. Do you, do you remember the name, the summer of recovery? Like they actually branded that yeah, summer sure. I, of I don't, recovery. I don't disagree that they tried to, I think that the entire tone of the Obama administration has always been uh, relentless optimism, right? And even Hillary tried to adopt it as part of her campaign, right? America's already great, right? And, and counter to what Trump has said. But I guess like, um, like I said, this is kind of a feels argument, but I feel like that optimism was pushed um, against the, and maybe it's because I worked in the casino industry where entertainment took the biggest hits, maybe. Um, it, it really did feel like, I or I felt like a feels argument. In 2007, 2008, it felt like the end of the world was being sold to the american people that shit was literally fucked um so i guess maybe that's where the maybe because i maybe i had more of an emotional view of it at the time versus what was actually going on um, i'll say yeah like like that industry got obliterated by the recession of course so i mean i think but but it goes beyond that there is very bad consumer confidence it's an important measurement too and honestly that's another metric where that's just been perpetually low um even even when we technically exit the recession consumer confidence has still been low it's only actually until recently where it is starting to pick back up and that does have a better outlook but that's another case where i'll say I, I understand what you're saying you're saying like it seemed kind of like it's better than what everybody was saying it would be mm -hmm. but again i'm going kind of by, by obama said this is going to be the summer of recovery and it, everything was totally worse in his projection. Sure. Yeah, no, I understand. Back. So that's a different perception. I understand what you're saying because because Obama, what you're saying is essentially Obama sold us that the United States would be suppress or surpassing itself, um, you, you know, prior to the housing bubble in every single uh, in every single meaningful metric, and that really didn't happen, right? Sure. Yeah, I'm saying exactly. It, sure. The results fell short of his own of his own projection. So I don't call that I don't call that a success. And I, I don't think where we are today is some sort of testament to his great policy. Economies tend to recover on their own without any intervention. Um, the question is, how can we intervene to minimize that time? And I don't think the Obama administration was very successful in doing that. Um, but yeah, that, that's kind of my premise. And the, another kind of whole dimension 
that we haven't talked about is monetary policy. And that's a time when you, I'm sure you're aware that like interest rates are at, at like an all time low. I think I they're mean, up to it, 0.5 now, I think. Exactly, finally, but exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's been years since people have talked about, oh, are interest rates going up this next quarter? Are they going up this next year? I, I really thought they were going to come up three years ago. And the fact that we're here in 2016 and they're and still at historic lows. New, and it feels exactly. like a damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of thing. Because I, I totally every agree. single time there's a, even like a fucking whisper from the Fed about interest rates going up. Oh, the Dow Jones is down 300 points. It's investors fear that interest rates are rising. Like It feels like one of those things that nobody wants to actually bite the bull and do, which is strange because the whole reason for the Federal Reserve being completely separate from government is so that they don't have to worry about politics influencing their decisions. Um, that I don't understand enough about that to criticize the Fed. Obviously, I would never pretend to. But I, as a layman, it does seem very bizarre to me that we've kept interest rates depressed for so fucking long that I, I never... And like you said, I thought that like I, I thought it was going to be before that like maybe because I bought into the Obama hype too much I thought that like four or five years ago we were going to start to see those interest rates start to, to kind of trend upwards as we started we to recover did. but yeah that seems yeah, really weird like you said it's a damned if you do damned if you don't but the reason it's a damned if you do damned if you don't is because our economy is still weak which again is counter to the idea that we've had a miraculous bounce back well I, think I don't think any economy ever wants but that, that's why I'm saying damn you do damn you don't because if the economy is doing shitty and you raise interest rates people are like well fuck you're trying to kick us while you're down but if the economy is booming and doing well people are like why are you going to put out interest rates and fuck us when we're doing so well like we just want to grow like why are you doing right because I because if Trump comes into office and the economy continues to grow and then people are like all right well we're going to go ahead and turn up interest rates I doubt that the markets are going to respond positively to that right like it seems like the markets always want access to, to cheap capital and whatnot no like does anybody really want interest rates to go up yeah because the, the people start to be afraid of inflation once once the economy once economic yeah but like that's like the big meme rate. that has been sold to us for so long right that was like one of the big memes that's like inflation is going to happen infl- but it never it seems like it hasn't happened yet it hasn't it? happened because we haven't had nominal gdp growth if we do get nominal gdp growth then it is going to start being a concern and it's one of those things where it's, it is like you said it's a delicate balance but they're, they're, and that's why investors would start looking. And that's why they haven't, because we haven't had the high levels of nominal GDP, yeah. where we would really start saying, okay, let's start a jack up race. We haven't had that. So that's why the rates are still at what point? Yeah, like you said, 0.5%. Point five percent of that, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So um, yeah, that, that's another area. And I guess the final, my final point on that would be the stock market. I would be interested in your opinion on that. I, I'm, I'm a pretty big believer in efficient markets lar- by and large. I know, you know, we get bubbles and, and such, but I was, I'm pretty surprised by the stock, mar- uh, stock market rally since Trump was elected. And I think even that is kind of a testament to the fact that investors have more faith and Trump's uh, regulatory. I totally steps. disagree. I actually like I actually memed about this literally on the night of the election. On the night of the election, I think the market dropped by was it two percent or maybe yeah, it dropped a lot initially. Yeah, yeah, it dropped a lot, and I rem- and I specifically said on stream that people were being fucking retarded, and that there's no fucking way that that drop was going to take. It. I specifically said you can find the vote on election night, and it, and the next day it went up. I think I don't think that the president on its own on their own is going to have like a dramatic impact on the markets like that, and I feel like that's why the bounce back happened. I don't, do you really think that like what what could Trump do like unilaterally? that would influence the markets like what executive order on the fucking s p 500 is he going to enact you know well i think it, you've seen you've seen the rallies heavily in the pharmaceutical and healthcare industries and i honestly do think that trump or not not even him but whoever he elects could get do the regulatory cuts and that could actually help the industry i guess i, I guess like happening. i don't even know if that's i don't even know i don't know it's really hard. Bit, the problem is that the market. Right? The problem is that the markets are so much driven by psychology as well, right? Like, like it's or at least it seems to me that psychology drives them. Like, I don't think anybody right now on the planet can say what the fuck is going to happen with healthcare in the United States, right? Because Trump run on it ran on a platform of pretty much completely dismantling Obamacare, right? That was his platform. Do you do you disagree with that? Oh, I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. So it seems like he ran on a platform completely dismantling the the Affordable Care Act coming in. But now it seems like he's completely walked back on that. And I don't even think if he'll push to repeal it at this point. I don't know. He he walked back a little bit, but he's definitely all full on board. Like the the guy he nominated for the human health secretary, secretary of human health. um, That guy, he's totally like he's been on the repeal Obamacare train from day one. So it seems like it's hap- is like he's definitely full of Yeah, I guess. But then Trump has would... also gone on saying things that like he likes pre-existing conditions. Like, can you really repeal pre-existing con- or can you really maintain pre-existing conditions, but then like get rid of the mandate and still keep it affordable? Like, I don't know. Like these are like it, it seems like the way that insurance works right now is that it's kind of gridlocked and there are so many competing interests. Like when I talk about like pre-existing conditions and individual mandate. Right. So like, OK, well, I like that everybody gets covered, um, you know, with pre-existing conditions. But the only way to make that affordable was with the mandate. Right. 
mandate isn't that part of the big like so if you get rid of the mandate people like me i'm never fucking buying insurance and you know i pay fucking 500 dollars a month now for me and aaron right i'm not buying insurance if i don't fucking have to so you so if healthy people like me jump off that right how are you going to afford insuring people at affordable rates with pre-existing conditions right like it seems like these things necessitate each other well the problem is what you said is we can't afford covering pre-existing conditions without a mandate yeah the reality seems to be that even with the mandate it's not enough to maintain a sustainable system that's what the pattern is so it's not even a matter of kind of like it's just a matter of it's not sustainable it's not working the arrangement of covering everybody with pre-existing conditions and also just have the mandate and hope that enough young people enroll and spread out the risk pool we hope they hope that would work but it simply isn't working well and i guess i don't know why it's not working now i don't know like why are prices going up? Because I tried to research articles, but it seems like everybody had 50 million different answers. Like nobody really knows. Like because while prices were rising under the ACA, prices are going to go up in, in a way that's unprecedented historically, right? They never they don't rise this fast. So why right. do you think prices are going up so much? It's it's actually pretty interesting because the insurance companies say that the costs associated with like the Ob covering the Obamacare um, risk pool were much higher than was promised or projected. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Obama administration is kind of challenging that and saying that according to the way they've assessed it, the costs aren't that. Um, again, I, I'm much more inclined to actually believe the companies that have stake and if, if it were profitable for them to follow the Obamacare business model, they would do it. And if it were profitable, other insurance companies would be moving in. But it's a sort of, again, it's a proof is in the pudding sort of thing. The, these insurance companies are pulling out. They're not doing it out of spite. They're doing it because they can't afford it. Um, and I think Obama knows that too. Obama, he, he's referred to it as like a starter home now and everybody needs to upgrade. So I think he had obviously hoped that Clinton would get elected and then successor to Obamacare would be kind of a step. They, they could still bill it as a spiritual successor to Obamacare while fixing a sure. lot of problems, but so, that's not going to happen anymore. I, I'm, I'm probably already know the answer. What do you, you, do you not, what do you think about single payer? <laughs> oh yeah. You know the answer. Yeah. I, I definitely am not in favor of single payer. Um, because I think the underlying issue with healthcare and I mean, I'm, I'm a I'm a supply side shitter, right? I'm a trickle down. Give my, but no, basically, I think the problem with healthcare costs is scarcity. Um, like, is a problem with every market where you where you have um, high prices and not enough to go around. So, um, and the issue with that is that Obamacare doesn't really solve scarcity. Um, just giving everybody insurance doesn't solve scarcity. So yeah, I, I agree. I, I don't think that the Affordable Care Act addressed any of the problems with prices. I think that they just addressed coverage. I don't disagree with that. I think that's the principal yeah. failure of the ACA is that it did absolutely nothing to combat coverage uh, prices, even in, even in places where it could have, um, like I think giving Medicaid the ability to negotiate price with um, with hospitals or whatever, even in doing things like that, it didn't actually do that. So yeah, it's yeah not only that, but like the number of um, health administrators, like it, career-wise has like increased by 30 something percent which is so the most like, profitable job to have in a hospital it seems like that administrative bureaucratic bloat is like a massive drain that seems to be unique to the united states healthcare system i don't understand why yeah and it's and that, that's perpetuated by obamacare and the regulations that's increased the demand for that so like i said that's not it, that's why it never was going to work because the underlying actual supply that goes around is, is the ultimate thing and bureaucratic red tape doesn't magically increase the supply of health care or the quality of it. And I think we're I think we're seeing that now. But also with the single payer, it also folds into other things. Um, I'm a pretty big proponent of free immigration, but I don't I absolutely don't think you could possibly have anything approximating free immigration and have a single payer health care system. Sure. Not, not even close. Sure. Just looking inside the framework of what's possible because free immigration is never going to happen. Right. Probably we're not in the foreseeable it, it, future. It, see, it, it could happen if we quote unquote gut, but obviously you want a more politically correct term to the welfare system. I would I would be I'm a proponent of cutting the welfare system and for having free immigration. But um, I know I, a lot of people obviously but which is kinda of ironic to me because in my mind helping the poor would be free immigration. That's how we that's how we did it in the past. If you made it to Ellis Island you were a citizen. Like I, I would like I, obviously it's never gonna be that easy again, but I think we can approximate that time again if we get the health care all right well but it seems like it's something like free immigration like the people then that need help the most are the ones that are hurt the most because they're the people that lack the ability to immigrate i mean that costs money right oh immigrating um i mean to a certain it does cost money but you this can is something that still, still maybe right? kind maybe this is something that bothered me about what um trump said about abortion leaving abortion up to states rights is people are very quick sometimes to drop that like well if you don't if you can't get an abortion in your state you can go to a different state that's the freedom of america and it's like well not everybody has the opportunity to just up and drive 150 miles to go like that's not within the reach of a lot of people depending on our economic situation you know well i would say 
we have a huge bottleneck with immigration, the legal immigration system, because mm -hmm. we have such low quotas and we have such high wait lists. Yeah, I so, think it, it can I be think, up to like 10 years if you're immigrating from Mexico legally. The system right now is broken, but it seems like nobody... Exactly, which is why I'm strongly against it. I, I'm a proponent of a lot of free, of free immigration and even just kind of cutting down those wait lists a lot would be a big step in the right direction. But that's not compatible with the kinds of welfare systems that Democrats want, Sure. which is the irony to me, because I think if you really were a proponent of the unprivileged, that's immigrants trying to get in the country to me. Um, and that's incompatible with a single payer pipe dream do where you, a lot of the, sorry, go ahead. Are you, are you sure? Yeah, no, I understand what you're saying. Do, do you think that giving, um, w do you think that insurance is fundamentally incompatible with free markets? No, I don't, I don't think it's incompatible with free markets at all, but it, it, here, here's what is incompatible with free markets. And I, I might get into territory, libertarian esque territory, but, um, I'll have to like link I'll see if I can find it, but there's a study recently by Harvard that um, showed a very large culprit in the cost of pharmaceuticals is FDA granted monopolies, and this wasn't any sort of like conservative think tank. It was just purely, it was purely tracking the costs and the fact that we can't import pharmaceuticals from other countries, and we also grant monopolies on pharmaceuticals, FDA grants monopolies, and the process of attaining FDA approval is so expensive that that monopolization itself is what creates such enormous prices. And those prices, and that monopolization leads down to the like the lack of the price negotiation you see. And all of that like bleeds into the insurance system where you don't have price transparency, you don't you don't have negotiation. Every and, well for, for I guess one a couple things. Like every time I read case studies about this, it seems like there are it always turns out that there's a good reason for it. Do you you remember the EpiPen thing going on? Yeah, I, like I, when I, I read remember. about the EpiPen thing, a lot of people were complaining like, oh, right, overregulation, FDA problems, blah, 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 blah. But then when you looked at the products that all of the competitors were creating, they were literally things that had fail rates that would have, you know, potentially costed millions of people their lives. Like when you're talking even like a tenth of a percentage point can make the difference between tens of thousands of people living or dying using a product. Like I, I, I always hear the regulation meme and the FDA stuff, but it seems really hard pressed when I, when I ask people like, what is a specific regulation the FDA has that you consider unreasonable? Or what is a monopoly granted where other people could compete with, with good products? Products, but they're just not able to because of regulations. It always seems like people fall short in giving product examples. Um, I, I'll give you a, a kind of a converse product example. Sure. Um, and the converse would be probably LASIK surgery. I don't know if you've, ever, if you've ever had eye problems or anything. No. But I mean, you've heard of LASIK surgery, right? Yeah. Yeah. What's amazing is since that's purely an elective operation, that's outside the realm of insurance. And you can go get state-of-the-art LASIK which is technology that even exists not too long ago, to get that done for like a couple thousand dollars. Do you know anything and, about uh, John Stossel? Yes, I do know. Okay, I, I watched I, I his like piece John on this, so I, I know exactly oh, what I you're talking about. I didn't, actually, I haven't oh, seen yeah, yeah, he's got a big either. piece on this. Essentially, the idea is LASIK care, I think um, 15 years ago in the United States, was actually complete dog shit. Um, there are no um, insurance memes or any other kind of bullshit that impacts LASIK eye surgery, or, or not even LASIK, but eye surgeries in general, because um, it, it goes by other names besides LASIK, depending on the technology. And because it's an elective surgery and because they have to compete on price, LASIK surgery has advanced uh, medically in, in completely unprecedented ways, and the price is even reasonable and whatnot, too. Yeah, because it's all transparent. And yeah. The, the reason why I asked you earlier, though, going into the LASIK surgery, because John Stossel in that same piece talks about the problems of insurance. And, and this is the reason why I asked you if insurance is fundamentally incompatible with the with a free market is because it seems like insurance destroys the pricing mechanisms, which makes it so that your consumers can't act as, as rational agents in a market. So, so like as an example, if I well, I, I mean, this is real life in the United States. Nobody ever in the history. Well, there may be one person in all the United States has actually gone to a hospital based on price right because if you have insurance you're looking in network and then that's it you don't care like how much a procedure costs at any hospital or how good or whatever right you're just going to a place in network and you choose it but because the insurance serves there as like a screen against ever selecting a hospital based on price or quality or anything like that you're usually always just choosing the best thing all the time even if it's massive fucking overkill right i think john stossel's example in his uh piece that the same one you don't know the license surgeries but you you go to a grocery store and you pay for grocery insurance if you did that every single time you went to the store you would just load your cart up with fillets every single time and you would walk out with you know tens of thousands of dollars in groceries and nobody would ever think of about anything you know right right um I, I think that does happen i think a lot of the reason that does happen i would personally blame on the regulations and like the lack of competition um that basically and the and like i was saying the monopolization of drug prices which basically obfuscates all of the sort of pricing um such that you, you it's not even transparent what you're getting charged for when you when you go out so yeah of course totally yeah. Make, and i don't know if that's the actually caused by insurance itself I'm more inclined to believe that's caused by just all of the bureaucracy and the red tape. 
Um, but I, I, I don't know if I, I'm not inclined to think that the insurance market, like insurance on principle is against the free market or is, um, so I would have to like listen to Sossel's piece on that, but it sounds gotcha. interesting. I, I, I guess like, it's just the problem is that when you're dealing with such a hyper inelastic demand, which healthcare kind of is like, it seems really hard to fit a pricing mechanism in there, right? Like if you're having a heart attack, you're not going to, you know, quickly look up, you know, who's got the best you know, cheapest heart attack doctor, right? You're going to wherever's first. And it seems like that kind of stuff can interfere with market forces, you know? Oh, I totally agree. And like with an elastic demand, like you said, so even if somebody can't afford it, they're still going to get it. And then it's just going to, the cost is just going to be on the hospital. That's why I, I'm really focused on supply side approaches, um, actually increasing the quality, um, or not quality, but even just the quantity. Like, like kind of like you said, you said the EpiPen thing that, okay, one decimal point can lead to a certain number of people suffering due to the unintended consequences. Well, the conver like conversely, it's okay. Well, how many people would benefit from the successes of it? And it's really hard to weigh that. And I don't think oh, sure. I, I don't think the regulation does a good job of setting the scale. Possibly. Um, or why don't you have the option then of if you can't afford an EpiPen, why don't you have the option of buying an inferior product if it's the only thing? Exactly. You? And sure. a lot of people are against that on principle, but I still think that could lead to better aggregate outcomes. Can we? That, that would. I, I, we can agree on one thing, right? Patent systems in the United States are fucking retarded, right? Have been abused like a motherfucker and exist in such extreme ways that they are completely fucked, right? Do you think that that's true? Or? I, I think it's true, but I honestly don't know how to fix it because the whole idea of intellectual property, I'm not sure where you and I stand on that. It's I'm okay pretty... with the concept of intellectual property to some extent, but like when you're literally extending it like 79 years past, like I don't know, it seems pretty stupid to me, but... Yeah, but it's it's pretty hard to justify any line you draw. Um, that's what I mean, I think you can justify like I think that like something like on a piece of media, I think that like a year or maybe two, I think it's pretty justifiable, right? Like if you make Star Wars and it's really cool, maybe you don't want somebody making Star Wars two before you do, right? Because they literally watch the movie and make it immediately after release in six months or some shit. Like I don't know, I can, I kind of see that, but a year or two, yeah, I, I could I could definitely see that. Um... I guess like, I, I'm not only applying it to intellectual property too, but looking at things like the EpiPen or, or like uh, Advil or whatever. Like I don't know, like how long how are, are they long are these patents lasting that they're able to carry off into like decades or whatever? Like, and here's one, not, not even patents, but I think a big one is also, and this is a I think a proposal of Trump's that I agree with. If he actually does, I don't know if he will, but it's importing pharmaceuticals um, because then you're you're protecting IP. It's not like they haven't stolen their, your patents, assuming they haven't. You, but you're saying just, Trump wants to import pharmaceuticals? Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, right, gotcha. Like, by by a Canadian version of EpiPen, and it, it, the patent's still protected because the Canadians didn't you know they didn't steal the same patent or whatever, but it well, just allows for more competition. Kind of, I mean, yeah, yeah. That gets really China, weird though. Example, yeah, yeah, because you're like, stuff, or yeah. if you look at like Taiwan or whatever, for example, has no respect whatsoever for intellectual property laws and you know bootlegs and all that shit. But yeah, China will like hack uh, U.S. companies and then t take the trade secrets and then make it. And so yeah, that that, that <laughs> oh, is yeah. kind of like yeah, that would kind of suck for a company that had a patent. But I, again, I I still think it's a um, a good solution and if, if there are cases like that you know i think they should be taken on a case-by-case -case basis but by and large i think that'd be a pretty good solution to the, to the whole um patent system would be allowing imports on pharmaceuticals sure all right okay well i'm gonna play video games so again that's all right man have fun okay i'll see you later buddy later all right guys are we ready to play some video games aren't you guys excited He's literally saying, I want the free market by buying government-created medicine. I don't think that's what he was saying. That guy talks out of his ass. Clinton enjoyed tech bubble. Bush enjoyed housing bubble. Obama took on a depression that almost as bad as the Great Depression. We have become a solely service industry. Plus 2% is the new norm unless you prop up a bubble. Whoa, is 2% the new norm though? Do you actually know that? The reason the stock market is up since Trump victory is because they are expecting big infrastructure spending from Trump. Also, they hope deregulations, mostly for banks, would likely prop up another bubble somewhere. Oh, shit. Oh, because they were talking about repealing um, Dodd-Frank, right? Ooh, I don't know about those memes. <laughs> 